Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, posable sculptures, as well as animatronics. And you can find out more or order your own dinosaur at trxdinosaurs.com. And by the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Every year they host experts from around the world to present the latest research happening in the field of paleontology. You can get more information at tyrrellmuseum.com and view previous speakers on YouTube. This week we have an interview with Sean Keenan, a concept artist and creator of the upcoming book Dinosaurs of the Wild West. We also have Dinosaur of the Day Epidexeterix and a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, as always, we would like to thank all of our patrons and give shout outs to some of our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, those Stegosaurus patrons are Chris, Nicholas, Blaze Campbell, Trent Carbajal, Paralorolophus, Stefan, Nutmeg, and Taya. And Taya has been a Stegosaurus patron for a little while, but we weren't thanking her. Oops. Thanks, Taya. And thanks to all of our patrons. We really appreciate you. And to thank you for those of you who have been with us since February 14th, Valentine's Day. Check our Patreon page for our special premium audio content, the love stories from our Top 10 Dinosaur series. Yeah, we didn't figure out how we were going to distribute it when we were talking about it last week. But it looks like posting it on Patreon is probably the easiest way to get it. And then it's just around forever. So if you join later, you could go back and get it too. And as a reminder, our page is patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping right into the news, we have a new article from Geobios, and it was written by Alexander Averyanov and others. And it's about a new dinosaur from Russia. It's actually still in press. I guess Geobios has a pretty long publication cycle. And I was waiting for about a month for it to publish, but it still says it's in press, so I'm just going to go ahead and report it. <laughs> so there was a dinosaur that had been called Siberosaurus in the press for a while that I think we mentioned back in 2015 or 16 when this dinosaur was first discovered, but they actually ended up naming it Siberotitan Astrosacralis. Ooh. Yeah. But also pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> Siberotitan, Siberosaurus, pretty close. They named it Siberotitan because it's a titanosaur from Siberia, and Astrosacralis is star in Greek plus sacred bone in Latin, but I think it's really more about sacrum which is a bone in the body. And they say it's, quote, an allusion to the unusual configuration of sacral ribs, which radiate in dorsal view from the middle of the sacrum as the rays of a star, end quote. It's kind of nice. So it's like a star sacrum. <laughs> <laughs> and the sacrum is in humans, too. It's the bone that ends with the tailbone. It's the middle part of the hips that goes up in between the you know, outer part of the hips. <laughs> so if you kind of go up from your tailbone, you're, that's all the sacrum in the middle there. They found Siberotitan near the Kia River in the Kemerovo province in West Siberia. And it's not that far west. It looks like the middle of Siberia to me. It's north of the point between Kazakhstan and Mongolia. In other words, north of the westernmost part of China. It kind of gives you a ballpark of what part of Siberia it's in, because Siberia is enormous. <laughs> and it's the same location that some previous Siberian sauropods had been found, and some of those were associated with the species in the paper. They hadn't really been named before. They found this sacrum about 10 meters or 30 feet off the ground in the side of a cliff, and there's a picture of one of the paleontologists digging a vertebra out of the cliff while hanging off a rope ladder. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty intense. You can't see the ground in the picture, too, which makes it look even more creepy. And I think he just has, like, one leg looped around the rope ladder, and both of his arms and his other leg are just kind of hanging off to the side. But he's tied. I think he's suspended, too, by his waist. He must not be afraid of heights, though. No, I don't think so. <laughs> or at least his love of dinosaurs is helping him push past it. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. 
Yeah. I, I could if I had the harness, I think. I'd be okay with it. For dinosaurs. <laughs> think of the dinosaurs. <laughs> Including the previous finds from the spot, they associated with Siberotitan parts of the hips, some teeth, a foot, and lots of vertebrae. So a pretty good showing, but unfortunately there's no leg or arm bones in the mix, which means you can't get a very good size estimate for the size of Siberotitan. But it was large. Yeah, must have been. Looked like the hips, that sacrum thing, was probably about a meter wide or so. Hmm. It's like, you know, like a titanosaur, you would expect big. <laughs> they also think it's pretty old for an Asian titanosaur. They listed as early Cretaceous and then they wrote Baramian <laughs> with a question mark in the abstract, which I thought was funny to put a question mark after the period. But that would put it in the 125 to 130 million year old time frame, which is pretty old for a titanosaur, especially one in Asia. The lead author on this paper also described another titanosaur last year, and that was Tengrisaurus that we talked about. And that one was found about 500 miles east of this discovery, also in Siberia. But that one was only known from three tail vertebrae. So this one's a little bit more complete. And next, thanks to Chris for sharing this with us on Twitter. There's a new paper published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution by Kiara O'Donovan and others. And what these researchers did is they made a biogeographical model of how dinosaurs moved and evolved around Earth during the Mesozoic. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I think they basically started with assumptions that are still kind of questioned, like where the first dinosaurs were. They assume they started in South America, which is usually the main place people put dinosaurs as starting out. But they weren't like testing any of those types of things. They were starting with basically the best guesses of where dinosaurs are, and then they were trying to fill in the gaps. Hmm. So really what they were trying to do is reconstruct throughout the Mesozoic how the different groups of dinosaurs moved all over the Earth. So they found that at first the dinosaurs speciated <laughs> in order to be able to live in more places. So basically if you figure they're going to move somewhere colder, they're going to evolve into a new species that's going to be able to tolerate the cold because the ones that can't handle it are dying when they're trying to move there. And thus survival of the fittest makes a new species in the cold climate and, you know, so on and so forth all around the whole earth. So you've got different species for up in the mountains and down in the plains and in the high latitudes, and everywhere in between. So eventually, actually not taking that long of a period of time, dinosaurs covered the entire planet. And now you've got dinosaurs covering the whole planet. What can they do now to continue evolving and to get that edge over their competition? What the researchers found is that they started evolving within the same environment and even competing for the same types of resources, so basically filling the same niches, which is kind of surprising, but they were adding different types of display structures, as on hadrosaurs that were in the same areas, and other features to kind of differentiate species from one another. They also think that this might have been a natural lead-in to flying, because that could be a result of this whole speciating and trying to differentiate in the same environment, filling the same niches as your close relatives, whether you're starting with the feathers for running up trees or wing-assisted incline running or display or whatever, it could all come out of this type of speciating that they're talking about. Interestingly, they also point out that as a result of this, it may have saved them from the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Because if they hadn't been under this pressure, after they had taken over the whole world, basically, to continue evolving and... And speciating? Yes. <laughs> then they might not have evolved into birds, and they may not have survived the Cretaceous mass extinction. Can you imagine a world without birds? It would just be terrible. What would birders do? <laughs> They'd have to be some other kind of errs, like froggers mm. or something. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm using the wrong language there too. It's not really the pressure to speciate, but more the ability that birds have to speciate. Because they also point out that after the extinction, 
the birds again, slash dinosaurs, again, <laughs> evolved to cover the entire planet with all sorts of different adaptations all over again. So it might almost be something special to dinosaurs slash birds that they have this ability to kind of spread out and fill all these niches and kind of radically change. Pretty interesting idea. Indeed. And I also want to quickly follow up with the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument and its status as a national monument. We mentioned in SVP that that the U.S. government is potentially going to shrink the national monument or get rid of it in order to potentially drill for oil or do some other such economic activity that you can't do in a national monument. And when we were at SVP, they had a whole talk about how bad of an idea this is and how we could lose lots of fossils in exploring the area for oil or whatever else they might do. And the Bureau of Land Management just recently put out a request for public input. So if you're interested in submitting any comments that you might have, you can grab the link from our show notes and submit a public comment to their record. Just as an FYI, like with all of these public comments, like happened with net neutrality and happens all the time, your name and address becomes part of the public record if you submit a comment. So just be aware of that. Make sure you're okay with everybody knowing who you are (laughs) and what you said. But we're going to stay apolitical about this. But if you feel the need to do anything, we have the link for you. In other news, we have some good news. Uh, Senators have passed a bill to make Utah Raptor the Utah State Dinosaur. That was quick. Well, it's not totally done yet. Oh. So the bill passed 26 to 0 and now goes to the House. Utah still has Allosaurus as the state fossil, as a reminder, so they're not losing anything. And Kenyon Roberts, the 10-year-old who got this bill into motion, addressed the Senate about the dinosaurs after they passed the bill. (laughs) (laughs) That's fun. Yeah, good for him. I hope he brought in like a toy Utah raptor or something as like an exhibit to show everybody. (laughs) I don't think he did. I think he was just answering questions. Oh, that's fun too. (laughs) But speaking of students, there's a high school student in St. George, Utah, who recently got a grant to help map previously unknown dinosaur track sites. And the grant comes from Dixie State University. The student's name is Connor Bennett. He's a junior in high school, and he's loved dinosaurs since he was a kid. And he's been volunteering at the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site at Johnson Farm for the past four years and is currently an intern. He and paleontologist Andrew Milner will be mapping 200 sites around Lake Powell in June. And one of the sites they'll be looking at is nicknamed Andre's Alcove Track Site. They'll be looking at small and medium-sized carnivorous footprints as well as prosauropod tracks, and they'll be mapping the sites to protect them and give scientists some more information about dinosaurs in the area. I love mapping. I made a map when I was in high school for a project, too. It was really fun. Did it have anything to do with dinosaurs? It was just regular human trails. Eh, boring. Yeah. (laughs) But now we have a map on our website of dinosaur museums, which might be working again by the time this airs, hopefully. (laughs) Hopefully. We've got some Mary Anning news. She's been getting some well-deserved attention this year. We've talked about films that are being made about her, but there's also a new play about her that's happening at Dorset Libraries in the UK this month. And one theater company is producing it. It's called Mary Anning's Fossil Depot. The play was written by Peter John Cooper and portrays Mary and her brother Joseph's life and includes small fossils that are introduced for children to touch. The shows are about 50 minutes long. They have a Q&A session after. It's meant for kids ages 5 to 12, though obviously adults are welcome, and it costs eight pounds for adults. It's free for kids. Cool. And last, thought I'd end this news segment on some dinosaur snow stories. Hmm. So first in Japan at the Fukui Dinosaur Museum, there were animatronic dinosaurs hanging out in the snow. Not by choice. They were just already out there, and then it snowed a whole bunch, 54 inches. (laughs) That is a lot. Yeah, and one of the ornithopods and one of the theropods is totally covered in this video that I saw, and they're moving their heads up and down and making noises, so it almost looks like they're protesting. Next in Aurora, Illinois, one dad, Scott Mulvoy, put on a T-Rex costume to clear snow from their sidewalk, and his wife had bought him the costume for Christmas. There's a video going around with the caption, Who says snow blowing can't be fun? (laughs) In the video, 
he's walking around clearing the snow, and he said that the costume kept him warm with the battery pack and fan. We were wondering about that in a previous uh, story about snow blowing in a T-Rex costume. Yeah. <laughs> And he said he was sweating by the end. And he said, quote, I just wanted to lighten the mood because everybody's complaining about the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and last, in Canton, Michigan, a woman who goes by the name Bernice the Dinosaur wore a T-Rex costume to clear snow in her neighborhood. And in the video, you can see her walking around with a snowblower. That seems to be the new thing to do in those T-Rex inflatable costumes. It's it's shovel or snowblower. Probably not the most fun chore, <laughs> but then you, now you can make it more fun. That's true. It definitely isn't the most fun chore. I know you never had to do it as a kid. Nope. But speaking as a former Wisconsinite, it's terrible. (laughs) Before we get into our interview, we want to pause for a word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs. And I know that Valentine's Day has just passed, but Sabrina really missed a golden opportunity to give me a dinosaur sculpture or puppet. (laughs) Didn't realize that's what you wanted. <laughs> it would have been nice. I'm just saying. Maybe the next uh, holiday or gift giving It's never event. too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're thinking of someone who wants a dinosaur sculpture or puppet or animatronic, or maybe you're thinking that you want one. Maybe you're thinking it's not too late for Valentine's Day for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you should definitely go to trxdinosaurs.com and tell them exactly what kind of dinosaur you would like them to make you because they'll make you whatever kind of dinosaur you can imagine. As far as we know, they've mostly made theropods so far, but they are open to making all sorts of different things. I think part of the reason theropods are popular is they fit well with the puppet mechanism. You can get your arm in the proportions of the neck of a theropod, whereas getting your arm inside like a sauropod neck <laughs> would be kind of tricky even with a baby because they're similar proportions to the adult. So you need like a really skinny arm. The sculptures too are more life size. Oh yeah, very true. But I suppose it would be really cool if you just got like some baby like ceratopsians or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe even just like an adult but a smaller ceratopsian. One thing that I think would just be amazing is if you remade the fighting dinosaurs, which is that Velociraptor (laughs) and Protoceratops that got buried in a Mongolian sand dune all those millions of years ago while they were fighting, it'd just be amazing. And I think they would really recreate well, given the style that TRX Dinosaurs uses. I agree. Is that a hint, Garrett? (laughs) I don't know if we have space for that much dinosaur action but i think that would be a really cool museum display if any museums are interested and also it would be cool to see what kind of animatronics could get worked into that too Mm -hmm. so again if you're interested in getting a dinosaur animatronic puppet or sculpture then head over to trxdinosaurs.com and if you want to follow their latest and greatest creations then you should follow them on instagram at trxdinosaurs And now on to our interview with Sean Keenan. Today we have with us Sean Keenan, who's a concept artist in the video game and animation industries, and he's also the creator of the upcoming book Dinosaurs of the Wild West, and you may have seen some of these images floating around the interwebs. (laughs) Can you tell us what inspired you to create this massive, awesome book of, it's over 130 illustrations? Yeah, so it goes all the way back to when I was a kid, honestly. I've been drawing ever since I was a kid, and I've always loved dinosaurs. Uh, and so I remember having all these little these dinosaur books, and I even made little like guides to dinosaurs and mimic the books that I had on my shelves. And so it was just a passion, you know. And then as I got older, like most kids, you know, you grew out of the dinosaur phase a little bit. Um, I always <laughs> liked dinosaurs, but I I wasn't as into them as when I growing up as a teenager and whatnot. And then just as I got older and found myself in my career, I, I just found my passion for dinosaurs rekindled. Mm-hmm. And I also love the Old West. Mm-hmm. And so these are two things that I ended up combining because I had a conversation with my cousin, actually. Uh, back up a little bit. I was talking to my cousin um, who I grew up with, and we were having this conversation about why wasn't there, to our knowledge, why wasn't there ever any 
movie or comic book or something where you see this world of dinosaurs and cowboys. Um, <laughs> that, you, you know, um, and I was like, man, that's a, that's a really good question. And I took that as an inspiration just to start drawing. I just started drawing some uh, cowboys and dinosaurs just as one little one-off drawings, nothing beyond anything, just a fun little uh, sketch I'd post on Instagram. And after a couple of uh, drawings, I mean, three or four in, I was like, man, this is like a little series. And people are really responding to it. And people are thinking, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. And I found myself, as I, the more I would do with them, the more I would get excited about them. And I, I'd have new ideas of different dinosaurs to put in the series and different kind of Old West characters. And it, it literally just took on a life of its own. And so it was a very organic thing of, of me having this passion for dinosaurs, having a conversation with my cousin and then spraying that idea and then me just having fun with it. And then now it's just blossomed into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then so are they all drawings or are there also painting other mediums you've done? Yeah, I say about half of them are pencil drawings. And then I would... I would scan the pencil drawings into Photoshop and then I would paint them in Photoshop as a digital painting Mm -hmm. and keep them all black and white. And then also uh, the the other half of them, um, even at the stage of where I'm creating all the art, uh, I draw them all digitally on a Cintiq, which a Cintiq is a, if you know what a Cintiq is, it's a big monitor that you actually like draw on like Mm -hmm. a tablet, but it's a big tablet and I, and I have a stylus. And so it's pretty much just like drawing a paper. And what's great about that is it's very quick. I can, if I make a mistake, I can fix it really quick and it's just, it just speeds up the process. And although I really still do love drawing pencil drawings and, and a lot of my sketches when I do ideation and I, I think about ideas, I do a lot of sketches with just little uh, ink drawings with pen and they're little thumbnails and just, just getting the gestures right. Just thinking of, you know, those scenarios of stories that I want to add to these illustrations and so it's a mix of traditional media and uh, digital, digital drawing, digital painting. Cool. And then, so how did you come up with these scenarios? Because you've got over a hundred now. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's it's a combination of movies I've seen, paintings I've seen. Uh, just basically, and also just thinking about uh, human interactions with other animals. You know, so I, I would think of. Like I, I did one where you have a, a, he's a cowboy is trying to get his stubborn stylosaurus to move. And, <laughs> you know, that came out, you know, you, you see the classic, you know, the, the stubborn donkey or the pack mule just won't budge. And just simply giving these dinosaurs a personality beyond these cold blooded monsters, you know, giving them this, mm-hmm. a warmer kind of personality. And that's, that's one of the key things about, about this is, is I'm, I'm stylizing them a little bit and I'm giving them a little bit more personality and you, you see the interaction with people. And I love animals and I have dogs and I, I, I use also use like the way we interact with our, our pets. That's another inspiration I, I use. Think of these scenarios of how to put these dinosaurs into uh, situations with these people. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, it's just everyday life and, and, and in pop culture and, and just anything that, spurs my interest it, it goes in <laughs> you know, it's, again it's very organic and actually one thing i'm also putting into the book is this little a, a little narrative it's it's not in your face it's not really with words but it's you'll, you'll see a character reappear throughout the book mm-hmm. and she you see a story begin with her and just through the images it tells a story and you re, and you see this relationship that she has with these people and with her dinosaurs and it's this this little it keeps calling back to her and it's cool because it's, you don't see it. If you're not paying attention, you're like, Oh, uh, maybe that's, Oh, that's the same person I just saw a couple pages ago. Oh, there she is again <laughs> with that dinosaur. And it's just this fun thing to like, if you really pay attention, it'll, it'll jump out at you. And I'm doing that with a couple other characters. So it's, it's like subtle storytelling, you know, and it mm-hmm. also saves me the problem of like having to write, which is something I'll probably <laughs> look to do later, maybe do some more writing later. But right now I'm just establishing this big world and it's, it's an art book, you know, it's an introduction into this world that I'm just organically creating and it's, I'm just having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that's great. So all of these characters you're, you're creating kind of after you came up with the scenarios. Exactly. And you know, that's how a lot of times some of these stuff is created. You know, it starts off as just like a little fun thing you're doing. And then as it takes on a life of its own, you, you, you start 
liking certain characters you create or, or what's funny is also sometimes um, people who follow me on Instagram, they'll I'll post the drawing and they're like, oh, is that the same guy from like a month ago? And they'll start <laughs> reading things into the images that I never intended. And I'm like, that's that's really fun to see that happen. And it gives me more ideas. The thing that I'm struggling with now is feature creep, right? Like, and so I keep thinking of new things I want to keep adding, but I have to finish it. I have like a deadline I've given myself that I have to finish. So mm-hmm. I have to have like a cutoff and I keep getting new ideas that I want to add into it. If I do that, I'll never finish. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's always like the, the plight of the artist, right? Like you're always, you want to put more in, but you have to finish it. And I'm almost done with all my art this month. And so I've, I've had a color point and I'm self-disciplined enough to try to <laughs> impose that upon myself. Okay, this is when it's going to be done. Does that mean you're maybe planning a sequel if you have enough ideas? A sequel or some other, yeah, like that's the thing. I, I, and my wife helps me a lot too. We'll sit down and we'll talk about different ideas, of where to, what, what to do next. Because um, I have all these, these different characters that you'll see kind of reappear and each one of them could have a, a really fun, interesting backstory. I, you know, there's a sheriff character, there's a mountain man, there's a miner, there's like this gambler guy uh, and uh, – all this potential. So I'm, uh, right now I'm just focusing on just an introduction to this big world. And then once, once it's done, then I'll, I'll tackle the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. So since we're a dinosaur podcast, I have to ask, how yeah. many different types of dinosaurs do you have in your book? Oh, wow. A I, lot. A lot. Um, yeah, I figured. <laughs> a lot. I don't know the exact number. I'd, I'd probably say probably close to maybe around 80 or so, mm-hmm. maybe even more. Um, some repeat, some, you know, some of my favorite dinosaurs you'll see, you'll see a couple of times, but most, most illustrations are, are one-offs of, you know, introducing a new dinosaur. And that's one of the things that I, I wanted to share about this project for me is once I got into this project, like I've always loved dinosaurs, but as I got into this project more and I like, okay, I'm going to go all in with this. My, my uh, interest in dinosaurs just as a, as a whole got rekindled. And so I started researching more and I started finding all these species that I didn't even know about, which yeah. sounds There's a lot. ridiculous. <laughs> There's a lot that, but the, some of them were quite popular, like Dino Kiris, I think that's the, the, the one that was just, they just knew of his big arms. Oh, and yeah. Claws. oh yeah. It actually looks really <laughs> goofy. It looks really goofy. It's like a duckbill face. And I'm like, <laughs> that is so crazy. How do I not know about that? And uh, um, Acrocanthosaurus was another one I really never heard of until like a, maybe a year or so ago. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Chungtungasaurus, the giant hadrosaur. Oh, yeah. And so I, I just was addicted again to dinosaurs. Just beyond the art side of things, I started going to web channels, watching documentaries, the whole thing with Spinosaurus and the reconstruction of Ross Spinosaurus. <laughs> and that's another thing as well is as I was doing these drawings, when I started, like, so if you look at the drawings I did at the beginning where I was just like doing little one-off sketches. Mm-hmm. They were stylized and they were based off my kind of basic knowledge, but they wasn't. They weren't meant to be scientific specific dinosaurs. They were just be to be fun, mm-hmm. right? But as I went, as I continued onward, I found myself wanting to be more faithful to the latest knowledge of how these dinosaurs were actually in life, but still stylize them in a way, you know. So having mm-hmm. a, a, a nice marriage. So, and I'm keeping my old drawings in the book, so you'll see the evolution of the style kind of change as I got more proficient. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so one big thing is the like the position of the hands for a lot of theropods, right? Like we know that they cannot pronate down. Mm-hmm. They, they they the palms face each other and they're kind of set there. Whereas, so I have a lot of drawings of my rap my old raptor drawings were one almost completely featherless, and two they had like the what I call the golem arms, where they're like kind of <laughs> hanging down. Uh, stylistically, it looks like a cool movie monster, but it wasn't accurate. Mm-hmm. And so I've also kind of gone back and redid some of the old dinosaurs. And I'll, you'll see some before and after. Like, here's what dinosaur I drew like a year and a half ago. And here's kind of updated versions still in the same style, but taking the more scientific cues to kind of bring it up to date. And as I got more educated going through this process, I wanted to go back. Uh, even Spinosaurus, I still, even a year and a half ago, still drawing Spinosaurus the way you see them in Jurassic Park 3. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of faintly aware of the idea that it was quadrupedal and almost like it walked on its knuckles, all this weird, it's like a weird, such a weird animal, you know, that, that they believe it was now and the shape of the sail. So I went back and I would update, you know, I have, there's like a couple of versions of Spinal Source I have in my book that you'll see. And so that was one thing that was really great is learning 
as I was going through this and being very mindful of of the scientific part of it, but also keeping like the fun and stylized art side of it as well. Yeah. I think that's why I'm I'm a fan of your work. I notice like because it does seem pretty realistic to what we know, but then <laughs> obviously you've also got the Wild West and the uh, Cowboys. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, and it's it's really cool too to show different versions because especially with something like Spinosaurus, where we don't have that many remains, there's still a little bit of debate about whether it was exactly. bipedal or quadrupedal. So having it in different styles and different functions in the book is kind of a cool way to represent the different ideas going on. Exactly, exactly. At, at one point, I was like, oh, I'm not going to put the old ones in because they're you kind of get tired of your old work. You don't want to say, Ugh, you know, it's, it's awful. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I was talking to my wife, like, no, you got to keep it in there. It's, it's cool to see the the progression. And, um, and I think people will appreciate to see that. So I've had to fight not going back. <laughs> if I do redo a dinosaur, I, I'll still keep in the old version of it so you can see how it changes. And and some people even some prefer the old old version, even though it's not scientifically accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, it it's still cool as a creature, you know, mm-hmm. and you still identify it as what it is. And so that's another thing I, I've, I've noticed too. I have two separate kinds of people who really like my work. I got the scientific people who, who will be quick to like, well, actually, uh, <laughs> and they'll correct me on something. And then you have the other people who just enjoy it as just on, at the base level, just it's, it's their dinosaurs and their cowboys and it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I try, I want to, I want to try to please both by having like this this marriage of, of, of both kind of coming together. Yeah. But you can't be too, I mean, when you're talking about people riding dinosaurs and stuff like that, you don't really exactly. expect them to be <laughs> exactly scientifically accurate. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And that's the thing that was, another thing I started as I got further into, you know, looking into like dinosaur figurines and sculptures and just seeing the debates of, People seem like, oh, like, oh, this dinosaur has a shrink wrapped face. Oh, this one doesn't. And I'm like, a shrink wrapped bad or good? I'm not sure. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Do you, do you know what I mean by that when they say shrink wrapped? Yep. Yeah. So are they are they saying like dinosaurs did not have that? You couldn't see the cavities in their skulls like that? Yeah, I think basically the most of the shrink wrapping discussion <laughs> comes from people where they're saying, most people kind of get their idea of what a T-Rex or something looks like by staring at a skull for a really long time. And what you end up doing is sure. you end up accentuating all these features of the skull. But if you look at, say, a horse skull or a human skull or something, there are openings in our skull, too, which you have no idea that are there because there's all this like muscle and tissue and stuff on top of it. Mm-hmm. So once... If you like shrink wrap it, they're basically saying like there's no tissue. You're just like it's just like a skull <laughs> plus skin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then there are some lizards and stuff that kind of look like that. You know what I mean? Like where you can actually yeah. see some of these things that you you know, it's really hard exactly. to say. Exactly. Even like you know, like a uh, crocodiles and alligators, like mm-hmm. their their head almost looks just like their skull too. You know? Exactly. But yeah, so it's fascinating. It it is fascinating. But, you know, the shrink wrapping look at lends itself to more like, you know, more menacing looking. Mm-hmm. So it's cool for toys and stuff. But uh, I, I just found that amusing. Like, I didn't even know that was like a a huge topic of debate. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's, just, it's just fun to kind of dive into this this world again. And what's also cool is like like you guys found me and I also have like, you know, paleontologists and dinosaur people who follow me on Instagram who aren't necessarily like, artists or other you know like i have a lot of other artists who follow me and people who like cool things to you know like dancers and whatnot but Mm -hmm. just getting the other spectrum of legit like people who are you know Mm -hmm. study these things but they also have fun looking at you know something ridiculous like dancers and cowboys Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) yeah and i'm I'm looking through your instagram now and i really like this woolly stegosaurus that you posted a while back (laughs) oh thanks yeah yeah so that was that that predates the Wild dinosaurs, wild west, but I definitely I've always been drawing dinosaurs, and that was a, a fun concept. I thought would just be a really fun creature to try to see what what would it be like, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And I wanted to do some more like woolly dinosaurs as like a little mini series, and I'll probably revisit that at some point. And that's the thing I'm, I'm very not fickle, yeah, maybe fickle. Like <laughs> I, I just want to keep moving on to the next thing, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the, the Willis Stegosaurus is, is really a fun creature. And again, he's he's stylized, but you know right away that he's a Stegosaurus and he's woolly, so it's ridiculous, yeah. but it's fun. 
<laughs> he stands out too. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, some of my favorite ones are the ones where you have sort of like a scene and it's kind of imagining how a dinosaur might fit into the lifestyle of the West. Like you have the snake oil salesman type guy with the dimetrodon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with his, he, the, you know, he's like, well, the sale would make a great canvas for a sign, so I'll just yeah. put a paint on the, on the sale. And, and that's cool that you brought that up because there's – that's one thing that I, I try to like to do is thinking of a dinosaur's shape and, and what they are as a second dinosaur and then what would be a fun way to put them into the, into the world. So the dimensional is, is definitely an example. I like the sauropod with, like, the covered wagon on the back of it yeah. too. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, and one thing I've kind of done is I've I've kind of attributed certain dinosaurs to certain people. So there's like this tribe of Native Americans that they they use Pachycephalosaurus and Centrosaurus, mm -hmm. and so you'll see you'll see repeated these Native Americans with Pachycephalosaurus, you know, in kind of a like that's like their animal of choice, you know, just like in the Plains Indians they had their horses and their buffalo, mm -hmm. right? Like so, in keeping things consistent as it goes is also thinking so. I've given a lot of like the outlaws, like raptor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sleeker theropods. Again, just just having fun with it, and that's the thing too. Like when I'm like, okay, what dinosaur? Once I figure out like a dinosaur that I haven't done yet, and I like when I found like Dinochirus. Is it Dinochirus or Dinochirus? We say Dinochirus, but a lot of these are okay. Kind of unclear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, once I figured out, found out about the Dinochirus, I was like, man, that's gonna be a really fun. So I, I was really thinking about how to incorporate that and one thing is like okay there, there comes a point where you want to you have an idea and it's like with any cartoon or anything that's like fantasy based right you there's a, a element of disbelief that you just put in there so he has like this giant hump on his back so but you know camels have a hump on their back so they're able to put things on that hump but they just kind of get creative with the saddle and the things they kind of built it around and uh, i did like this big get on a car with two native americans on it and it has like this big giant basket with a bunch of little compies inside like they're traveling <laughs> and it has like the little and they have a lot of little papoose dangling <laughs> off the side and that was really fun to figure out like how to put this apparatus on this dino chiris to make it look balanced and but at the same time try not to overthink it too much mm -hmm. because that's a, one of the struggles for me as an artist is overthinking things and okay just make it look believable enough and then if it's a fun image and it works as as a little story, then it's successful, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the style, too, is kind of old westy, so everything is a little bit slapped together. You know, it's not like exactly. pristine engineering work going on. <laughs> exactly. You, you, you totally nailed it. Yeah, this is kind of a you know, cattywampus, stashed together kind of uh, style, which really lends itself perfectly to to that. Oh, yeah, that was another one. I, uh, the, I have a Kentrosaurus being used as like a, a plow horse, you know, so he has like the, the plow straps are hooked to the two shoulder spikes. Oh yeah. But yeah, so that's really fun to figure out scenarios to put these different dinosaurs in. Yeah. I also like the ones with the kids where they're riding a dinosaur or they're like walking with a dinosaur and then they're also holding their toy dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah definitely yeah my, my my wife's like you have no children put some children in there I'm like, that's a great idea because <laughs> i get so mapped up in like the cool like sheriff or outlaw and like very you know but think about the kids man think about some fun kids things and uh so there's a lot of images i haven't posted on instagram because i want to keep so a lot of surprises for the book, you know, mm -hmm. and that's been hard because I'm like, oh, this one's really cool, but oh, I'm going to hold off to it and I'm not going to post it because I want to. But so posting just enough to get people still interested, mm -hmm. but not just showing everything and then being like, well, why you get the book? I can see it all on Instagram. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. And speaking of the book, you had a really successful Kickstarter project to bring it to life. I think it raised over like $30,000. And yeah, yeah. That blew me away. <laughs> your <laughs> your explainer video, I really enjoyed. You had this like epic music. <laughs> oh, thank you. I worked hard on that, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, my wife was teasing me because I, I, I was really trying to find the right music, and you know, it's a, that you pay for a little license fee, and I, but it was really fun to put that all together, and 
in art college, I did a little video editing back in the day. So it was kind of cool to dust, dust that off and kind of get back into that mindset. But yeah, that, that was definitely a huge, uh, a huge jump for me to do the Kickstarter thing. I'd seen some artists that I admire do successful Kickstarters and of I was like, this is the only way I'm going to be able to make make a book, you know, because making books is is expensive. Mm -hmm. And I've been on Instagram for a couple of years, maybe three years, four years. And just over the years, just building an audience and building a followership. And I've been drawing these Old West Dinosaur series uh, for about the last past year. So people really like aware of this. And people are like, man, when are you going to do something with this? (laughs) Every single time I post a new drawing, people will either say, this should be a book, this should be a movie, this should be a cartoon or a video game or a board game. It should be something other than just a drawing. You should do something with it. And mm-hmm. and so I finally uh, just took that to faith and, and just went through and, and began a Kickstarter campaign. And uh, I think just because I had a lot of momentum going into it, um, that helped a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of tried to make it an event I I told a lot of people about the Kickstarter's okay, in one month Kickstarter is going to go live and I kind of built up to it and I was very lucky that it, it it funded in like 6 days and then after that it just kept going. That's awesome. And yeah. that was really it was really encouraging. I'm like, wow, there's there's a kind of a there's a a need for this or not a need, not a need, <laughs> a, a want. <laughs> people need it. <laughs> Some people definitely uh, felt like they needed it, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I needed to finish it. That's for thing. So, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was really, it was really encouraging. That continued to motivate me further as I would hit these creative walls, these, you know, almost like a writer's block, artist block or whatnot, or kind of, or, or a little bit of burnout because I've been drawing this stuff for, you know, over a year and a half. And, mm-hmm. but when I get new people discovering it and they, I see they pre-order the book or I, See people, you know, the people comment on the on the drawings. It, it gave me this extra shot of motivation. I'm like, okay, these people are really respond. They they're, they they want to see more, and it, it would get me through some of the days where I'm, I, I just felt I wasn't feeling it, or you know, I I had to feel I had no inspiration, or so that was a huge step, and I, to the point where I, you know, I'm planning on I want to do another another Kickstarter next year. I don't know if it's going to be for this series or or, or a different series, mm-hmm. but I'm definitely gonna. My goal is I want to keep moving forward with put myself out there as an independent artist, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So as an artist, what are some of your influences? Um, A lot of influences. Uh, So (laughs) I grew up, I grew up in the 80s. And so I grew up with a lot of crazy 80s movies and I grew up with Disney. I used to want to be a Disney animator, like a 2D animator. That's Mm -hmm. what I wanted to be for a very long time. But also, I also loved just world building. Uh, so when I would see movies like Never Any Story and Labyrinth and even like the Muppet movies, like these <laughs> movies with all these crazy characters and these mm-hmm. crazy worlds, and I, I would go and I would just draw my own stuff. And so uh, as I got older and I, you know, I got playing video, like playing Nintendo games and these role playing games and this, these expansive worlds, I always wanted to create the worlds that I was playing like in games and watching the movies. And so the inspirations would be just everything that I took in as a kid. And also just a lot of uh, museum visits. My parents took me to the museum, me and my sister the museum a lot when we were kids, Mm -hmm. Uh, natural history museums, art museums, uh, just all kinds of museums. And so as a kid, I was taking all this stuff in and it, it was fuel and uh so I have, a, I have a huge passion for wildlife animals nature of all kinds i love disneyland i love <laughs> the world building that disneyland has like you go in and like you, you're transformed to this place you know because and just the fascinating aspect of like the sets and the props and everything that's put together to you know, you forget you're in Anaheim, California, you're, <laughs> you're in the jungle or you're in, you know, and, and that always fascinated me as a kid. So as a concept artist, um, I've had the opportunities of creating worlds for like different video games and things and, and drawing upon those inspirations as a kid, you know, so it's, it's a lot of things. 
<laughs> yeah, when you mentioned, when you had your list of things that people said you should do with these drawings, the one that popped mm. out to me was definitely a role-playing game because you could imagine these mm. individual mm. characters and like, you know, the different absolutely. decisions they make and stuff like that. Oh, absolutely. And, and especially, you know, I, I created, I, I don't know, I, I had it on Instagram for a while, but I deleted it because I, I, it wasn't finished, but I, I created a giant map. It's going to be a double-page spread of this entire world of nice. all the towns and everything and it kind of lends itself to this big world like you said like an R- rpg and mm-hmm. oh yeah i played all, a lot of rpgs as a kid you know the, <laughs> like the and just the idea of building a team of characters you have all the different crazy characters and they all come with their different dinosaurs and mm-hmm. it's it, it just it's perfect man <laughs> it is i love a good map too you should finish is that going to be in the book Oh, definitely. <laughs> nice. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I, I just finished it last week, actually, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's, it's cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Maps are the best. Maps and dinosaurs. <laughs> Maps and dinosaurs, yeah. The map was fun. It was, a, it was a nice break just to kind of get in map mode. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's, it was really fun to, like, look at old maps from the Wild West, and I have some books. If, you know, like, I have this book of, of, of the Native American territories, and you have all these crazy cool maps of so it's a blend of of how, how you know how maps look, but it also has some fun elements thrown to the map as well. Almost like you'd see like at a theme park, where you have like these cool little call outs of. Mm. So it's it's fun to look at, you know. But mm. it's it's cool. So I had a lot of fun doing that. Nice. So for people who have missed out on the Kickstarter, is there a way to order your book? Yes, definitely. If you go to the Kickstarter page and you look for Dance of the Wild West, I've linked my kickstarter page to backer kit and backer kit is a third party website that takes care of all the back end stuff and so i've I've created a pre-order store through backer kit and so you can go to the kickstarter page and there'll be a a big button that says pre-orders here and it'll then take you there and you can pre-order the book you can get like the little I, i made some print series so there's like a sheriff set there's a cowboy set uh, women of the wild west and there are three prints each of different characters and a lot of people really like those mm-hmm. and so you can kind of a la carte order that and i'll probably shut that down early spring and so there's still there's still some good time to pre-order if you're so interested <laughs> nice <laughs> awesome and then yeah. we've got your instagram at Sean Michael Keenan, are there any other places where people can go to find your work? Uh, SeanKeenan.com is um, my art website. So that has a lot of non-dinosaur stuff on there. There's some dinosaur <laughs> things on there too, but um, there's there's some uh, like paintings and stuff and concept art there. But my most up-to-date and the most current thing like is my Instagram. That's where I post a lot of my just everyday art and that's where I'm the most active on. Mm-hmm. That's funny, actually. Uh, so I first saw your art on Pinterest because I think people were pinning yes. what you're posting on Instagram. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Well, see that, and that's cool because like there was one day I was I was doing a Google search for like saddles or like I was looking for like a certain kind of saddle for reference, and then I was just scrolling down and I saw one of my drawings in like the Google Images. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I don't know something saddle, it, it, and I was like, what the heck? And I went and I saw and. It was all on Pinterest, and that's cool. Like that's pe- people have, have re- you know they put it on there. And um, what's what's really cool though is this project has gotten me work for uh, freelance work because people have seen this. Oh, cool! Um, they, they've come, they've come across this. Um, I've even gotten like studio work from different studios because they've they've seen this and they've like, oh, that's really cool. And it's something unrelated, but it was something that caught their eye mm-hmm. and. We moved into something else. And what's also interesting is this idea of dinosaurs plus cowboys or dinosaurs plus Wild West isn't like completely original. I mean, I did a sign for a lady in, oh, was it Wyoming? For like a gift shop, like a dinosaur gift shop. She's like, it, and she wanted it themed around cowboys and dinosaurs. And so <laughs> she did a Google search and then my stuff just popped up. <laughs> and so she hired me to do something similar, but in what, what, what she wanted. And I've done a couple of that, a couple of little one-off freelance gigs where people had this idea of like, ah, this idea for this dinosaur cowboy thing. And then they would search it, see that I've pretty much done it all. <laughs> I've, I've explored this world and they then hired me to do some work. And so that's been really cool as well. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> oh, did you read the um, uh, Michael Crichton book, Dragon Teeth? No, I did not. It's kind of, I mean, it's a, a different version of Wild West and dinosaurs, but it's oh, about nice. the Bone Wars, if you're familiar oh, with that. Oh, nice. I'm vaguely familiar, yeah. Yeah, so it takes place in the literal Wild West. It's a fic, you know, it's historical fiction, but it's a guy trying to get these dinosaurs out of the Wild West, and there's all these the people. Fossils, yeah. Yeah, the, the oh, fossils, nice. not real dinosaurs. <laughs> well, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. So that's nice. kind of a fun combination of the two, too. Definitely. No, it's definitely a fun world to explore, and it's it's one where I've been excited about it enough to take it to this extent. Because it's a passion project, right? Like, I wouldn't spend this much time on something if I wasn't really enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And um, and to see other people respond to it, like, it's, it's really cool. Like, doing studio work for video games is, is one thing that can be rewarding. But it's a whole nother level when it's something that you create yourself mm-hmm. that takes a life of its own. And just even be able to talk on a dinosaur podcast with you guys. Like, that's <laughs> insane. Like, that's so awesome. Like, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations and thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, and thank chatting. you. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks again, Sean. That was really fun to talk to you and hear about your process. And we're fans of your work. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to your book. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. The Royal Tyrrell Museum's annual speaker series brings world-renowned scientists and researchers to the museum and offers them a platform to discuss hot topics in paleontology and to share results of their current research with the public. They're also the only museum in Canada that's dedicated exclusively to the science of paleontology. Yeah, it's really cool how they have the museum laid out because you basically, like a lot of these paleontology museums, kind of start at the beginning and then work your way through all the different eras. Actually, that's only in one section because first you start out with a bunch of dinosaurs because they know what the people want, but eventually (laughs) you go through the timeline thing. And the museum is so huge that they have two of my all-time favorite dinosaur specimens in it. They have both Borealopelta, that amazing notosaur that got preserved in such lifelike creation, and you can get so close to it. It's actually my profile picture in a couple of places because I love that dinosaur so much. And then, That's a good one. Yeah. And then they also have Black Beauty, which is this T-Rex that the way it was preserved and fossilized, it actually turned really dark black, the fossil itself. And they recreated kind of the death pose that it was discovered in, but they did it vertically. So it's almost like it's standing in the death pose and you look up at it. It's just amazing looking. So I highly recommend going there. Yes, and if you can make it there on February 22nd, which is the next installment of the speaker series, it's going to be featuring Corwin Sullivan from the University of Alberta talking about insights from China on the dinosaurian origin of birds. Nice. Yeah, China has a lot to say about that in general in their fossil record. (laughs) So many feathers. Yes. If you can't make it, though, it will be available on YouTube along with all of their other previous talks. And... We will provide a link in our show notes. For more information on the Tyrrell Museum, you can go to their website at tyrrellmuseum.com and you can also learn more about the speaker series from there. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Epidexeterix, which was a request from Damien via Facebook, so thanks. It was a Paravian dinosaur that lived in the Jurassic in what is now China, and its full name is Epidexeterix huai. And the name means Hu's display feather, and the Chinese name Hu Shi Yaolong means Hu Yaoming's dragon. It's interesting it has a Chinese name to go with it. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So that name is in honor of Hu Yaoming, who was a paleomammalogist, which means they studied prehistoric mammals. It was found in the Daohu Guao beds in China, and it was described in 2008 by Zhang Fucheng and others. They found one specimen, which had four long feathers on the tail. And the specimen is now in the collection of the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing, China. It was about 10 inches or 25 centimeters long and weighed 164 grams or 5.8 ounces. Oh, we're not usually in the gram realm of things. <laughs> Tiny thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the holotype is probably of a subadult, though, so it might have gotten a little bigger. Mm. 
It had teeth in the front of its jaws with long front teeth that angled forward, and it may have lived in trees and hunted insects. It's got the earliest known example of ornamental feathers, the tail feathers. And these tail feathers may have been similar to a peacock's used for display in attracting mates. It could have also helped it balance on branches. The tail feathers are long and filamentous-like structures, and they lack a central shaft that runs through the middle of the feather and has veins on either side, which is interesting because more primitive animals than Epidexeteryx have fully formed feathers. It had simple body feathers, which were unique because they had a membranous structure at the base of the feather, which may show a stage of feather evolution. And this is similar to modern birds with a pygostyle, which supports the feathers. The shorter feathers covering its body could have helped with insulation. It didn't have wing feathers, but based on E, a relative, it may have had a membrane wing for gliding, though it's not clear if it did. It had similarities to oviraptorosaurs and therizinosauroids. It's not a direct ancestor to modern birds, but it has a close phylogenetic relationship, which means that it helps show the transition from non-avian dinosaurs to birds. And it lived around a lot of lakes and trees. Other animals that lived around the same time and place included insects, salamanders, lizards, pterosaurs, and primitive mammals. And our fun fact of the day is that, despite what Jurassic Park says, T-Rex could have seen you even if you weren't moving, and you probably already knew that, but you may not know (laughs) that some reptiles do have very poor vision and effectively can only see moving animals or objects. And that actually includes some snakes, which I'm thinking is probably why Jurassic Park featured T-Rex having that sort of you know, issue. (laughs) That's what I said. Yeah. (laughs) I know. Good job. (laughs) Thanks. I especially think that because we've heard that the original versions of the quote-unquote velociraptor had forked tongues, which is another snake-like characteristic. But the reason that snakes have this issue is that it's basically a limitation of their brain. In vertebrates, the retinas, the farthest back part of your eyeball, is actually an extension of your brain poking out through kind of the front of your skull into the back of your eye. It's pretty weird, but it's actually, if you look at an embryo developing, the brain pushes forward into the retina. So when we see these really large sections of the T-Rex brain that are associated with vision, it's basically showing that both the retina and the part of the brain that care about vision are really a big priority for the animal. So it could probably interpret more than just motion and really see some fine detail in what's going on around it. And therefore, if standing still would not save you. But it could save you from some reptiles. Yeah, like certain snakes, maybe. (laughs) But I don't know like what you do, because snakes are cold-blooded, right? So they could just sit there for a really long time and they'd be like, where'd it go? And then just be saying, where did it go for... Six hours or something while you stand oh, there starving point. to death. <laughs> good point. Maybe I'd get bored and leave if you're lucky. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also, if you'd like to join our growing community, check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.